So we missed out recording some of the stuff. My apologies for that. We're, from here will be recorded. Um, so if I'm just gonna revise, we've only missed a couple of slides. Uh, we were talking about how abstraction fits in in the uh, model of the uh, computational thinking. And there was two other things that we talked about last week or the weeks in the previous weeks, not just last week. Yeah, some of it was last week. But today we're in this lesson, we're going to talk about abstraction. Abstraction being uh, where we, uh, we limit what we're going to focus on just to the things that are important to our solving of this problem, the way we're going to solve it. And so one of the things that we do, object-oriented pro programming, is we focus on objects. And objects have properties, OK? And so object properties uh, could, uh, could relate to some variables, which have states. Uh, the variables have a type. So types of variables would be things like it can be a string, which is a bunch of characters, or it could be an individual character. Or it could be a number, which is like a, a number with um, a uh, integer number, uh, which is um, whole numbers. Uh, or it could be a a decimal number, which we call floats. And there's some others. Um, and the dictionaries kind of leads to that. And you'll see that the, the symbols there kind of build on each other, right? Uh, so like a dictionary is a place where you would store a bunch of maybe different kinds of variables. Okay, so in a dictionary, you might store um, some lists and you might store some, some variables. I mean, yes, yeah, so it's kind of cool. I mean, that's just, that's the other video that was, bogus. Sorry about that. Um, now, lists and dictionaries, they are uh, complex data, um, data storage. And we won't be looking at those in, oh, we might be doing lists, but we won't be doing just dictionaries. Lists, I think, yeah, actually lists we do do at the end of the course. So that'll be kind of fun. Uh, lists are really good for doing iteration, uh, because what we can do with a list, a list is just a bunch of data all of the same type that are sort of together in one big um, sort of data structure. And what we can do is we can scan through a list from the start to the end and find things, do things with the list, add things to the list, remove things from the list. It's quite a useful data um, type, a uh, complex data type. <clears throat> so I hope the example I gave you of the lawyer you know, receiving the room full of papers, right, uh, would be a good example for you to think of why we need abstraction, right? Abstraction would be if you had one piece of paper which said all the things that were wrong, rather than have thousands of pages and, and somewhere in there is the stuff that we want. Now, those are two extremes. So generally speaking, we'll look at something that won't be as bad as a room full of papers, but it will often have just information that we don't need, and we're just going to exclude that and only focus on the information that we do need, only the relevant, as it says. Um, and then for when we've abstracted, we can create a model. A model is a form of, of abstraction, or you could say a model is gonna be the result of abstracting. Um, so what, what you have with the model is something simple, which represents something real, which is a little bit more complex. All right, and so we have computer models, and we have lots of other models as well. Now, uh, when I was like 11 years old, I used to make model airplanes. You know, a kit would come and there'd be a lot of plastic stuff and there'd be some blue and I'd glue all the plastic stuff together and I'd paint everything. And the idea, the challenge was to make it look as real as possible, like, a, like something in a picture. But it's better than something in a picture because it's three dimensional, right? You can see the bottom and you can see the top and you can put it in this position and that position. And, you know, you can just look at it and it's really cool. You get an idea of it. Uh, so that was model airplane building. The model airplane, I think, is a good example of that. It represents something real. There was a real airplane, right? And it had a certain look. The model airplane shows the stuff that was important, which is the shape of everything and the colors of everything by the time I finished painting it. But there's a lot of stuff that's not needed that wasn't there. The model airplane didn't have any passengers didn't have any engines, you know what I mean? You know, it was, it was just plastic. And, and it was just there so that I could look at it when I was finished and say, that looks like that plane. All right, now some people make some more, more um, 
fancy model airplanes that actually fly, but the engines are not the same as the real airplane's engine. What do we got here? A calendar is an abstraction of time. It gives the times of the day, and we use calendars. That's an abstraction, as it's saying. Uh, it represents something real. What's real? The sun and the moon and the earth, they're real. The earth is spinning, right? Uh, relative to the sun, it spins around its axis once every 24 hours. So, I mean, you could say to somebody, uh, after the earth spins two times and halfway after, uh, through that, I'll see you at Starbucks and such and such. You could say that because that's what really it means two and a half days from now, right? But instead of that, we just say two and a half days from now and people know what it means, right? Uh, or likewise, we could say, you know, um, the earth went around the sun um, 15 times since I went to primary school. You know, and that's what we mean by 15 years, right? That the earth went around the sun. Every time that happens, that's a year. And uh, we know that because of the seasons and, you know, it, things work out. It, this is not guessing. We know this, right? Astronomy. We, we know that those things are there. So we have something real, which is the sun and the moon sort of working to, and the earth working together by gravitational force. And they move around each other. And uh, because of that, we see the seasons change. We see it go dark. We see it come light. We see the moon come out and the, and the phase of the moon change. All that stuff we see, which is something real. And then we have something abstract, which is a calendar. You know, uh, exams will be <laughs> once the month, or sorry, once the moon changes to this phase after, after a full cycle of the moon, right? We could say that. And if you stayed up and looked at the moon every night, you could, you could know when that would be. Right, uh, so the moon goes through its phase. I think it's like, is it every 29 or 30 days? It's not exactly a month because there's like 13 phases of the moon throughout a year, um, throughout a Julian or Gregorian calendar year. Yeah, anyway, so there's a, there's a lot about, oh, you could talk about that forever, right? You know, uh, do we care more about the moon or do we care more about the earth going around? Yeah, anyways, so we have different calendars because of that. Um, all right, so. Here's another example, something real. So actually this is, there is a real town called Rotherham and it's in the United Kingdom in you, uh, England. Yeah, it's actually in England. Uh, so there's a real town called Rotherham, but the fictional thing, the thing that's not true is that apparently it doesn't have an underground. In London, they call it the underground, right? Um, here we call it the Metro, right? Um, yeah, and, but yeah, we got a Metro. But apparently Rotherham doesn't have a, a metro. But if they had, so the fictional, the dream world um, uh, metro for Rotherham would be like this. Each of these round things would represent a train station. And it, we could put that on a map of Rotherham. And so that map's got a lot of stuff on it. I mean, you know, we've got different colors representing different uses of the land. And there's some, uh, some labels that go with them. You know, so maybe this is an industrial estate or something. I can see that's the center of the city down there. There's a lot of information in the map. And, you know, that's kind of nice if that's what the information that you wanted. But uh, if you're driving your car around there, yeah, that information would be really good, right? Uh, actually, if you're driving your car around there, you wouldn't care about where the train lines went. <laughs> you just want to know where the roads were, right? Um, but this one down below it is more abstract, okay? What we've got in the bottom right is a model which would represent the tube. This, so what names we got for it? The tube, as they call it in London or the underground or the metro uh, stations. And we would just do it like this. Now look, a lot more information there than there is here. But if you wanna get on the train, which one do you wanna look at? This or this? You like this? Well, you're gonna walk. <laughs> no, you know, I'm teasing you, right? This one, you know, because you like detail, okay? but. I think a lot of people, when they get on the train, they just want to know where's the next station, right? And what station do I get out of? You know, and so you're typically going to see something like this in the train. Yeah, this is nicer. I agree with you. Um, and especially if you do a lot of walking. Um, but if, if all you're concerned about is the train, then this one would be the one that you'll find in the train. Um, this one here apparently is a real one. <coughs> Washington, D.C. And uh, just like in Doha, they have different colors for the different lines. So, you, so if the color is the same, 
That means you could get on the train here. And if you went to sleep, when the train stopped, you'd be here, right? Yeah, anybody done that in Doha? You just stay on the train until, until it stops, change directions. Yeah, on the other hand, supposing you wanted to go to here, well, then you'd have to ride the train until you got to this station. Then you'd have to get off and change trains and go on that one. And so that information, which is all you need to know to get from here to here, that's clear on here. You could just look at it and say, yeah, I got to get off at that station. And then I got to find the green line. And probably in the station, they're going to have color codes in the station. So I can see which line is which. And so um, it's uh, very abstracted. Now, look, there is rivers, but the river is not like a real river. It's just sort of straight. All it is showing is there's a river there. <laughs> you know, so you know, all right. So on the train, we went through a river. You know, maybe you see it as you go. Um, that might help you because when you get out of the train station, that river is going to be a barrier to you, right? Unless you're going in another train or a bus or a car or something, the river is going to be a barrier. So you know that, right? When I get out of this station here, I'm not going to be able to walk to here, right? <laughs> Unless there's a bridge there somewhere. Um, so yeah, so it is um, nice and abstract. There's a lot of information that isn't included in there. Uh, as, and this is some of the information that is included. There's a lot of other information that isn't included, right? That all that geographical information. Here's another map. So our maps are representing physical reality, right? So physical reality, if this was a map of Qatar, it would be all more obvious to you. I mean, most of us don't spend a lot of time in, in um, Virginia. This is the state of Virginia in the United States. Um, so up here where my cursor is now, that's where Washington DC is, I think. Yeah, there's Richmond. So up here is Washington, D.C. Uh, Washington, D.C. is very close to this part of Virginia. People living in these places here, like Arlington, they actually go to work in Washington. And then there's another state over there, Maryland, because Washington's not a state. Uh, anyways, you know, political reasons. But uh, the map uh, is for a particular type of user, right? It's abstract. What it shows us is the boundaries, shows us a lot of towns, <clears throat> and it shows us major arterial roads in th thick red, and it shows us highways that are, I guess you could say state highways. Um, probably, yeah, 95 is an, uh, is an interstate highway. So yeah, I don't know if you know or care about the highways, the way they work in the United States. If it's got a five on the end and it's this kind of a thing, then it's an interstate highway going north and south. So over there in California, there's the I-5. And then over here is the I-95. And then in between, there's the I-75, the I-80, you know, et cetera. I-35 goes through Texas. Uh, anyways, if you get on this road, you can go all the way up to Maine or you can go all the way down to Florida. That's the I-95. And the I-85, but it turns out there, and that would go down through, I guess, to, to um, Atlanta. But you probably don't care about that. And then you have roads that go uh, east-west and they, the, if they're an interstate, they have a zero on the end. So the I-80, the I-10, the I, uh, okay. I don't know. You probably don't care about that either. None of you are gonna be truck drivers in the United States, so you don't care. I, and yeah, if I was you, I wouldn't care either. So uh, anyways, those are the, if, but if you were a truck driver in the United States, you would care, all right? This would mean a lot to you. Um, what is this, the symbols and what's going on there? All right, now, supposing you're not a truck driver in the United States, uh, all you wanna know is, you know, should I wear a raincoat tomorrow? <laughs> all right, so I live in Virginia, do I need a raincoat? Well, this might help you, right? Uh, first place, if I'm gonna wear a raincoat, um, better be a light one, because it's kind of warm. Um, and yeah, if I'm over here by Norfolk or Richmond, I might need a raincoat, but these, oh. Yeah, I don't see any lightning. But that looks like rain there at Richmond. So, I mean, that, that's the kind of information that that's giving you. You know, so, you know, what kind of clothes do I need to wear tomorrow? Or if you're a farmer, you know, um, do I need to buy more feed for my animals or not? You know, these kind of things actually they think about. So we got this idea of physical and we got this idea of information. So a map. There's a physical reality, which is this piece of land, the state, or Rotherham. And it's a real thing. And the map is a physical abstraction of that real thing. On the other hand, we have information like 
uh, we recorded a bunch of stuff in a census or something like that. And so there's a lot of information about people and jobs and stuff like that. And so that would be um, abstractions of physical things, uh, which would include these kind of things. Um, we have computer systems here at the college and they have to track, like today after this meeting, I'll have to record who was present, who was absent. So there's, for every student, there's details about the student, you know, there's student ID, student number, what courses they're enrolled in. And then for every teacher, there's information about the teacher in a computer system, you know, who's, what's their name, what's their, their number, and what courses do they teach? And then there's another um, bunch of information about the rooms where classes are. And so together, the teacher and the student and the classroom are all related in a class timing, right? So you, you got a, a report which said be here at this time, right? I got a report that said be here at this time. And that is, um, that is recorded in the system. So nobody else comes here at this time, right? Uh, so yeah, so we had to have properties of each of those entities. I'm teacher is an entity. Uh, so I'm a instance of that teacher. Student is an entity, and each one of you is a separate in instance of a, of a student in our computer system. You know, as a human being, you're a lot more than an instance, right? But in our computer system, you're an instance of a student. Your name is. Uh, and so we're going to record some things about you. And so for each of your grades that you have, we're going to record some numbers. And they might be integer numbers, or they might be float numbers. Uh, we're going to record um, some other details, which will be string variables. Uh, we might record some just single characters like A, B, C, you know, for grades. Um, so that's characters versus those other. So there's some notes. I hope you notice these notes at the bottom when we come to them. Um, when, we, <clears throat> when we analyze data, there's a process, and, and actually you're going to do a whole course on that, maybe more than one course. You know, data modeling, data analysis. And when you do your data modeling and your data analysis, then you come up with how you're going to store your data in your computer system. And nowadays, mostly we store those things in, um, in uh, relational databases. So you'll use a relational database tool like SQL. And then SQL will be running on a server somewhere, and you'll be building applications that will run on web servers. And so your web server will be able to access the SQL server using a programming language like PHP. And then you'll be writing JavaScript programs to manipulate the web page. And uh, with, between the JavaScript and the PHP, you'll be able to work with that data. Once that data is on the server, uh, the server will store many, many tables. And that data, you'll be able to get it when you need it. You'll be able to change it and update it. And so you have these dynamic, um, great systems running with uh, SQL, HTML, JavaScript, uh, PHP, and, um, uh, and uh, Python. Uh, maybe Java. So uh, yeah, so this is how you might store some data in a, an SQL database. SQL database are tabular. That means they're in tables. So a table is going to have some headings. Each one of those headings is going to represent a property of one of the entities. So we have uh, entities here, which would be the movies. So uh, the movie and each movie, each separate movie is a separate instance of a movie, right? And each instance is going to take up a record. So a record is going to be a row in the table. So that's a record. And it's for an instance, which is a row in the table, where the columns represent the um, properties of that. So properties of a uh, movie. Movies have titles. Movies were made in certain years. Movies have a length. Every movie has its own length. It's possible that some movies are, have the same length as other movies, but you know, movies have genres. Uh, you know, so we have sports movies, sci-fi, comedy. Um, how do we store it? Well, nowadays, I guess this is old, right? Any movies still on these old formats? I don't know, because everything's on, you know, the format now is uh, Netflix or, or what's the other ones? Uh, Paramount or OSN or something like that, right? Uh, there you go. So abstraction is going to take a lot of data and reduce it to a smaller amount. 
smaller amount of data. And um, it's possible that you can keep abstracting, getting less amounts of data. It's possible you went too far, all right? Or you put another layer of abstraction on it. When you do that, you see less and less of the information. And so that's what this is saying. If you get to the point where you've abstracted too far, uh, maybe you like to peel back a layer of that abstraction, undo the abstraction as it were, so you can see stuff that was kind of hidden. So kind of like that map we had of Brotherham, um, well, I've said he liked the map of Brotherham. I guess he's thinking about riding his bicycle around there or something, right? You know, uh, you know there's stuff in that map that he wanted to see. So if we, if we abstracted it too far to be like the map we had in the train station, well, then we'd have to, how are we going to get back that information? Well, so we go back a step in our data analysis to put back some information that we have. That's what we mean here about the layers. Uh, if we've got too much information, then we can do a little bit more abstracting. That's what this means. So suppressing means that we won't see as much and um, revealing means that we'll see more. And so, so yeah, as we abstract, the more we abstract, the less we're gonna see. Here's a nice example. And please do look at the notes at the bottom. <coughs> All right, so two different ways of saying the same thing, but uh, on the left is the abstract, the more abstract. And I suppose you could abstract this some more. And this is a little abstract too, but it's not as abstract, right? So this is uh, at least a layer or two less abstract, all right? And so it has more, it's more real worldy. So in the real world, when you send an email, you're going to have a page where you log in, you're gonna have some, some user interface that you're gonna to relate to. And every time you do your uh, sending an email, you'll remember that user interface. This is what I look at when I do an email. And so there's your user in interface. Uh, it could be a web app, you log into that. We could represent that just as a little box that says email application. And see, we've removed a lot of the information there, right? How it looks, you know, maybe the color, you know, uh, uh, where things are on the page. All we're saying is email application. Because that's enough for us in this abstraction of to say, please send an email. You know, uh, we, we're gonna do this, right? We're gonna open an email ap application and we're going to put some text into computer memory in the form of an email. Now in computer memory, the text is gonna be like this. We don't store words in computer memory. We store zeros and ones. That's the only thing a computer can work with. And so we have to have some way of tr translating this to and from zeros and ones, right? Our words. So we do have that. Our email application is able to take our words and translate them into zeros and ones so we can store them on the computer. Um, but that is how they are stored. We would just say, okay, we take our email application, we create an email, and that email goes into the computer memory. From the computer memory, it's acted upon by the computer software and then it's sent through the network to our intended recipient, the person who's gonna receive our email. So we put it on the network. Now, what does this mean? <laughs> Actually, what this is, is if you take your binary code, which is something like this, right? You can imagine the one is on and the zero is off. Okay, so imagine here that the one is the tops and the zeros is the bottoms. And so this is, would represent um, voltage. And so the top would be five volts and the bottom would be zero volts. I mean, that's how it's implemented on a, on a computer network, um, if it's a copper cable. I mean, if you were doing it in, um, uh, cop in optical fiber, it would be sort of bursts of light instead. But on a copper cable, it would be like this, on, off, on, off. And look here, we're on, 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 on. Uh, you can think of this as staying on for a while, then off then on a little bit, then off, all right? And so that would represent how these zeros and ones are put together. And so that's how it's, it is over the network. Um, so that's the reality, but all we say is send it on the network, please. And uh, hopefully we understand that. So I'm down to that. So I, I went quickly to the next slide. There it is, but just let's look at it. Um, if you had a, um, a rental company, and you rent out vehicles, uh, you would want to abstract the information about the vehicles as much as, as would be feasible. You don't want to abstract it to nothing, but you want to abstract it as much as will be feasible. There's a certain amount of information that you want to keep, 
And there's other information that you don't want to keep, I guess. I mean, you know, um, nowadays, now that data storage is uh, so much cheaper than it used to be, I mean, you know, we can store photos and all kinds of things. But, you know, we would store things like when's the next service date on this vehicle? Probably it's registration number, um, you know, wheel size, weight. Yeah. And a bunch of other stuff we would store about that computer, uh, that vehicle, which could be a car or a truck or a van. Um, now, in this um, car rental company, we have vans. So a van would be like a furniture removing van or something like that, right? You, you can move a lot of stuff around with it. Now, the bigger they are, the more you're going to have to charge because it's going to cost you more to keep that going, right? And so you're going to try and get the most size space for the least amount of money, you know, and, and you work on that. Um, so, and also your customers are going to want that. And so you're going to record for each van um, things about its cost and, and all of these things, right? All of these things were recorded because a van is a vehicle, right? A van is a vehicle. So all of that stuff you're going to record about the van, but you're also going to record the storage capacity. Now, if somebody's just going to come and rent a car to drive around as a tourist, they're not going to worry too much about the store storage capacity, right? You put a couple of suitcases in the back and that's all you care. Um, but if you're sort of moving furniture around with it, using it for commercial purposes, then you want to know how big it is. Um, and now the other thing is that we see that this van is related in some way to this, uh, the idea of a van, the concept of a van, the object van is related to the idea or the concept of a vehicle. And how is it related? Well, a van is a vehicle, but it's a vehicle which is specialized. So a van is like a child of this idea of a vehicle. And so we have this idea in, um, in object-oriented programming languages. So you're gonna learn about them. Uh, object-oriented programming languages where we have uh, parents and children objects and we have inheritance. The inheritance here is that the van has all the properties that are available to a vehicle. So a van has a service date. A van has a wheel size, a van has a weight and every one of these other things, but it also has storage capacity. But other vehicles that are not vans don't have those. So that's what we mean by the inheritance, that um, things about the, about the um, vehicle are inherited by the van. Got a few more slides to go. I hope you guys are doing okay. I know this is tiring and I do talk a lot and I apologize. Um, so if you, if you abstract too far, you can lose information and then you need to put that information back. And uh, so how are you gonna do that? You might have to create a new table if you're doing object, or, sorry, if you're doing um, relational databases. Uh, so we have a term for that um, where we say we, we have a problem with leakage. Uh, so, well, let's look at this. You wanted to operate a car and there's some information that's, that's missing, like the van thing, right? We, we, wanna, we wanna rent out this van, but we don't know what's the storage space. So what are we gonna have to do? We're gonna go and edit our model and change it to add to add storage space there. Or we might add a child to the vehicle um, object and call that vehicle a van that has that extra. So braking is not spelled like that. Okay. So I didn't write these. Any other uh, petrol heads here will know how to spell braking. Yeah, I mean, there is a braking like that, but it's the, the braking that they mentioned is like when you take a stick and go like that. Right? This is the braking where you stop something. Um, wow, the engine's not cool there. So um, if braking distance was important, so perhaps, you know, you had customers that safety was really, really important to them, braking distance would be really good. Any of you guys use those? Uh, you don't have to tell me, but, you know, just answer in your own mind. Uh, you use those balloon tires on your four by four car. Uh, if you do, you'll know about braking distance, especially if you put the pressure up to like 70 pounds because you have to put the pressure up to 70 pounds, don't you? Because you can never keep them balanced. Uh, ask me how I know. I used to have them on a car. You couldn't make that car stop. <laughs> especially if you had 80 pounds of pressure in the tires. So I, eventually I got rid of those. That's why they're banned in some places, I think. Anyways, I'm just saying that, be careful. Don't want anybody to have an accident. But you guys are all adults, you do what you think is right. So the idea of modeling is, as it says there, modeling is closely related to 
uh, abstraction. Remember, I gave you my example of a model, which is the model airplane. Model airplane represents something real in the real world, but represents it in a much um, simpler form. Um, and uh, we can use that in our computer systems, right? We, we uh, find out as much as we can about our real world problem and we make a model of it. And that model might show up as a diagram. Okay, so we do that a lot. So modeling, so we have data flow diagrams. Uh, for, um, for data, we would use things that we call um, uh, entity relationship modeling, entity relationship modeling. Yeah. I don't know if they still do that. I think so. Anyway, so here's some modeling and it shows what is a model related to reality. So a model, what does it do? A model represents reality. So we can do these arrows, right? This arrow means that this thing beside the arrow describes the arrow, right? So between this entity and this entity, we can say reality is represented by a model. That's what that arrow means. And then we got another arrow going the other way, which means that the model hides some details of reality. Um, so this is sort of a subset of what you would do if you're doing entity relationship modeling. There's a relationship between them. The arrow represents some, the relationship between them. The squares represent entities. Entities become tables in a, um, in a model, uh, sorry, in a relational database. Uh, that's so exciting, isn't that? All right, so uh, yeah, I guess we're sort of into this data modeling thing, right? So we're talking about entities and relationships, entity relationship models. And so entities are gonna become the things that we store data about. The relationships are gonna be how those entities um, work with other entities. And so, for example, we could have the entity A, which belongs to a set of entities B, I suppose, or another entity B. You could have an entity C, which contains entity D. So in other words, D is a subset of C. That's the example of our van, right? Our van entity is, can, is part of the vehicle entity. Vehicle entity includes vans. Um, the E happens before F. Okay, so now we're getting into some sequence, um, some programming going on there. G occupies the same space as H. Oh, they're co-space. That, that's the, now, that's not data modeling, but yeah, okay. Uh, so, Going straight back to the entity relational model. An entity would be, for example, we could have the entity at the college teachers. We could have the entity students. We could have the entity courses. Okay, each of those could be an entity. Then each of those entities has properties. The teacher has the properties. Teacher has a name. Teacher has a student, um, uh, a, a employee number. Teacher has courses that they teach, all right? Student, student has a name. Student has a student number. Student has courses that they're in. All right, um, so there's some properties about that student. Uh, then there's some types. Um, so a, a um, teacher and a student are both sort of subclass of, of sort of people that we're keeping in our system. And um, you notice that some of those, some of those um, properties are the same between them. Teachers have names, students have names. You know, teachers eat in the cafeteria, same as students do, it's that, it's that kind of thing. Rules, what are the rules between them? Uh, generally, there's one teacher per class, uh, you know, and generally there's multiple students, but there's no more than 22 in a class or 24 or whatever, those kind of things. Um, actions of an entity, I guess we could say, yeah, so students uh, do receive grades um, for uh, work that's done, so we have to record that. And so those kind of things, behaviors are there. Students sit exams and students receive grades. <clears throat> If you had a static model, that would be things that don't change. There's nothing happening in our system that's gonna change the data or change the model at any time. That would be static. Static just means it doesn't change. Whereas dynamic models, they can change um, depending on what inputs go with them, right? And so we have these ideas of state. You can have a change of state, as it says here, with a transition. And so you can have events that cause transitions to happen. And then you can have actions um, that are carried out during a transaction. So a transition. So we have transitions, states, events, and actions. So let's look and see if we can find those here. 
This is uh, going back to the Metro. We're at the Metro and we want to gain access to the Metro. We can't just walk into the Metro, right? We have to show a card or something. Uh, so instead of a coin, let's say we have a card, but there'll be this thing called a turnstile, which stops you from going in. And then you put your card there and then the turnstile, you know, the clutch goes on the turnstile and you can go in. And then when you're finished, it's, it locks up again, right? You go in and it locks and the next person has to put their card on. And that happens for every person that comes along has to happen. So supposing you don't, you don't use your card. So you start here at this, this um, block and you don't use your card, you just push. Nothing happens, right? Nothing happens. The system's kind of static at the moment. Um, but if you touch with your card, you touch the, um, the device there, instead of inserting a coin, so this is an old idea, I guess. Then the turnstile clutch releases and you can go in. And so you go there and it opens, right? Then when you finish that, it locks up again, right? And so uh, when you push, now it's locked. You'd have, if you wanted to, somebody else to go, they would have to touch it again. So where it says insert coin, that's really us because people don't really use coins so much anymore. Usually they use electronic card, but the same idea, right? <coughs> All right, so what you see on the left there, and I'm trying to not, not to waste your time too much. I'm, I'm sorry, this is kind of a long lecture. I'm talking a lot. Um, we're not far off. You can see there's like four slides left. And so we will get there, I promise you, and then I'll let you go. Um, but uh, there's this town, this is a real town. Konigsberg is on the Baltic Sea, which is, I don't know, it's between the border of Poland and Lithuania up there, you know, I don't know if you guys know that area, but up there, um, it used to be part of Germany. Um, so it was part of Germany until after World War I. And uh, there's this little town and this German guy, so Prussians are Germans, they're, they're, a, um, they're the Northern Germans, the ones that live up there. Um, Leonard Euler, he's a mathematician or he was a mathematician. So this is, I guess, a hundred years ago or a couple hundred years ago. And they asked him, well, look, can you, so the city can be divided up into different blocks. And some of those blocks are kind of like islands because there's canals and rivers that separate the different blocks of the city. And so uh, we have to use bridges and special roads to go from one block of the city to the other. You can't just go randomly across because we've got barriers there, right? We've got a, a canal here you can't walk across. The only way you can get across is by the, uh, by the bridge and the river, which is the same. There's a bridge there, there's the bridge there. So they said to him, well, can you, can you, can you give us a plan of how to go to, to visit all the different parts of the city without crossing the same bridge more than once. And if you remember from our earlier lectures, this is kind of like the traveling salesman problem. Traveling salesman problem was the salesman was in a car and the salesman had to go and visit all the different cities and do it as efficiently as possible. It's kind of like that, but it's a little bit more constrained than that because you're not even allowed to go back. And so this is what Euler came up with. He said, well, you know what? That's really distracting. Right, look at that map. You know, there's lots of stuff in there that I don't need to know in order to solve your problem. And so I'm going to abstract it. Right, so the abstraction was we got this thing here. We got the North Bank, which is this part over here, I suppose. We got a West Island over here. We've got an East Island over there and a South Island. So there's only four port parts. And then each of these lines would represent the bridge or the road that connects it. And so now it's much easier just looking at this. How do we get? To each of those things, you know, without going over the same bridge twice, you know, and so he was able to by doing a lot of abstraction. I hope by looking at this one, you can see the benefit of abstraction, right? So, I mean, this is much less distracting than this. You know, if you look at this, you're going to be able to find that solution a lot easier than looking at that. And that was his idea to abstract it. So it took a lot less effort to get the solution. Here's another abstraction. This is what scientists do. Uh, produce this type of a model, which represents, I mean, the shading represents temperature areas <clears throat> at a particular time, I suppose. Yeah, it says surface temperature different difference um, in degrees Kelvin. Um, and so uh, using model with mathematics, what they can do is, you know, if, we, if we've got measurements of all of these places over the last 20 years or 100 years or whatever, uh, we can put those in, then we can supply some mathematics to it and say, okay, this is what happened 
this is how the temperature changed over time. Uh, you know, uh, how are these different inputs affecting that? And uh, then we can find, um, maybe we can find some inputs that are causing the change. So, I mean, these are the type of models that they use for the climate change that they're talking about, uh, where they're, the carbon dioxide and methane and other gases in the atmosphere are causing the world to warm up a bit, and that changes the, the climate. So if you could measure all those things and then have some kind of mathematics, it'd be kind of complicated mathematics. There's a lot of stuff to sort of compute there. Uh, then you could sort of say, if you could get that mathematics to be correct for the last 100 years, then you could say, well, I can use that mathematics and I can imagine what's going to happen with the carbon dioxide and the methane and stuff. And so based on that, this is what I think is going to happen with the temperature. So I got a model. I got a mathematical model, and I think it works. A uh, bit more complicated, but the same idea of what we did with the blocks, right? We did with the blocks. Y is equal to 2x plus 1. Remember that? The blocks going across. So that was a model. This is a little bit more, more complicated, but same idea. All right, so I'm sorry we're jumping to a different thing there. We went to that model. Now we're coming back to the, to the data modeling. Data modeling, we've got an entity, and we have this idea of cardinality. Oh, the word's hidden down in the bottom there. Cardinality. There we go, cardinality. Uh, and what cardinality means is what is the relationship numerically between an entity and its properties? If there's a one-to-one -one relationship, then we can represent that in a single table. If there's a one-to-many relationship, then we're probably going to have to create a new table. And so what we see is for all of these things, the one there represents the cardinality, which is means that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between this entity and each of these properties. In other words, a student only has one date of birth. A student has one date of birth. A student doesn't have zero dates of birth. A student doesn't have two dates of birth, right? A student has one date of birth. Likewise, a student has one first name doesn't have zero first names and it doesn't have two first names. They got one first name. Now that, yeah, I think you'd have to sort of work with that one a bit. Some people have three or four names. All right, but uh, you know, going to the surname thing, same idea. Stu in this model, they're saying that a student has one surname, doesn't have zero surnames, doesn't have two surnames, got one. And same for street, house, number, town, both. Apparently students have more than one phone. And so we couldn't put the phone thing into the same table with the student we'd have to have another table, which would be the student phone table because uh, a student could have multiple phones. Data modeling. I'm not gonna give you a course on data modeling. That's in your future, all right? So this is just a preview of your data modeling that you're going to do. You would do these one-to-one, one-to-many relationships. If you saw one-to-many, you'd say, "Uh oh that won't work in a table. Better make a new table. And so that's what you'd do. You'd say, I got a student table and I got a student phone table two tables for that bunch of data. And here's another model. This model is kind of a process model and it's got things happening. Uh, unfortunately, the lines don't have arrows on them, but I think if you look at them, you'd be able to see how those arrows work. So somebody's making a credit card payment. Um, there needs to be an authorization of that payment. And so this thing happens before that. And then, um, the system is going to take that authorization only if there's an authorization will you be able to actually um, deliver the item the customer will get it and yeah so these things precede at the start of the transaction is those and then these things come afterwards that's a strange diagram anyways there we go and that's all that i've got for you today i could just sort of review if i was going to summarize i'd say uh, we were talking about abstraction in this diagram and the other diagrams there, we saw things made simple, things that were complex made simple. We like to do that because then we can work with them. And I hope that's enough for you guys for today. Um, now I was gonna offer you to give you the other lecture, but no, nah, I don't think so. <laughs>